Professor Odom, I'll uh, we, uh, the development editors have picked up the questions for you. So I'll start with the first questions and hope you are comfortable with it, right? Should we proceed? Sure, yes, thank you. Thank you. So the first question that we have, apart from the reshape of AUNS, what are the effect of power on the Aptober and complete delivery system? Yeah, so, so when the when the DNA ligands are on the gold stars and then they reshape into spheres, there is release of some of the DNA. We didn't quantify all of that release because that was uh, not as important to us, meaning we couldn't correlate the amount of release with any type of uh, effect. So in the process of, of reshaping based on uh, thermal effects, uh, there is some release of uh, DNA. So that, that can happen, but it's just not very controlled. And so that's the reason why we didn't pursue that further. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Odom. Uh, moving on to the next question. So, uh, so the question is, how do you account for the photothermal effect generated from these gold particles when combining them with biological medium? Gold particles are one of the most efficient photothermal agents. So this is the first question. Yeah, so we're trying to avoid photothermal effects. So we're not using these uh, constructs. We have different different things that I didn't talk about that take advantage of photothermal effects. But in the experiments that I that I uh, showed you, at least related to the biological experiment applications, we're using femtosecond pulses. So we're using femtosecond pulses. The mechanism of DNA release is a hot electron mechanism. So we're cleaving the gold sulfur bond and then the ligand is, is released. So we have optimized it such that we do not, these are very short irradiation times, four seconds or even 10 seconds. And so we, we just um, screened a, a range of conditions to ensure there's very little photothermal heating. And we just have enough uh, energy or power incident on, on the sample such that we're just cleaving the, the bond. So therefore, we don't result in any um, unwanted photothermal effects that we can't control. That's not to say photothermal is undesirable. We're looking that, for that in other applications, but that is better under continuous wave excitation for long periods of time, for example, 30 minutes or so. Um, that's not practical for, um, for a lot of uh, treatments, which is why we moved uh, away from those long uh, excitation times. Thank you, Professor Oda. Moving on to the second part of the question. Uh, the changes in the shape of the nanostars as a function power of the laser applied can be observed also in other forms of gold particles, such as nano rods, for example, or this is just a peculiar example of nanostars. Uh, I'm pretty confident that, well, I think this can happen for any nano uh, anisotropic gold shape. Um, I think it's easier to happen in the stars versus the spheres just based on the ligands. So for example, gold nanorods that synthesize are typically capped by uh, a, a lipid bilayer, or not a lipid bilayer, but a bilayer like CTAB. And this is uh, tightly bound to the particle surface and it's very difficult to remove. And so then the question then is, um, what types of powers might be necessary for the atoms to start moving, even if they are, are even if the particles are excited at the longitudinal, you know, near infrared resonance. So I would expect that it would be more difficult. Uh, I think it's possible, but more difficult for gold nanorods than the stars to reshape. There's another example, maybe this is like 15 years ago, um, where uh, Yunnan Shaw had made these uh, gold nano cages. And so if you flash them, with uh, uh, some type of, um, of camera light, uh, old school camera light, those can also reshape into spheres. And I think the reason those can, again, is related to some of the ligands. So in, in those processes, he's, there, there aren't these strongly bound uh, ligands on the particle surface for stabilization. Either there's a PVP you know, shape directing, and then it's, um, and then there's like, loose, you know, non-tightly bound ligands on, on the surface. So I think the ligand uh, binding energies play a role. I don't know what that is, but I think that 
uh, if I were to guess, the, the tighter the ligand, I would say binding, I would expect that it would take much higher powers to, to see the reshaping. Yeah. So well, let's move to the next question. Uh, is this DNA loading in buffer specific? And does the star-shaped uh, gold nanoparticles are toxic for normal and cancer cells? as gold nanoparticles have peroxidase-like activity. So would you like to shed some light on this, Professor Odom? Okay, let me start with a second. Um, so in order for the uh, constructs to show any type of nanozyme, you've identified peroxidase uh, activity, the, the ligands are really quite important. And so this is uh, something that the community doesn't talk enough about, which is why I spent so much time on that slide and our quantification of the number of ligands, as well as whether the, the DNA retains a, its shape. Because if you don't know what's on the particle surface, you might assume that the, the, con the, the, the gold nanoparticle core is doing something. And I, I don't think that the gold uh, is doing anything uh, adverse. Uh, for sure it doesn't, uh, if, uh, it just for sure it doesn't destroy cancer cells we've done uh, or normal cells. We've done these experiments where um, these animal experiments or there's so much gold nanostar in the, in the kidneys that it turns green. Um, and if you look at the blood work as well, the hematology uh, assays, as well as um, some of the, um, the, 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 the histone staining, there's just, um, there's, there's nothing. So, but, uh, if you have some ligands or other uh, impurities from the synthetic solution that you can't control, then perhaps it can result in these adverse uh, effects. But th by themselves, unless you engineer it with this, a very particular ligand, then um, it can't do it. That said, uh, gold nanorods, as I mentioned earlier, are typically uh, functionalized with uh, CTAB. CTAB in itself is cytotoxic. This is a problem. <laughs> and so if you have gold anorods that are coated with uh, CTAB, you, you're gonna get cell death, but in maybe ways that you didn't want. Um, so if your goal is to design a construct that can result in that, then you need to be for certain that the, 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 the outcome is related to what you think you have on the surface and not to the CTAB. It's pretty obvious the, the cell, cell health is compromised when um, when CTAB is, is around. Yeah. And I, I forgot the first part of the question because it was sort of complicated. It's like two parts. Yeah. So the first part was that is this DNA loading in, is this DNA loading buffer specific, like the citrate buffer? So this was the question. No. no. So, so uh, the Merkin group first published uh, increased DNA loading using PBS, phosphate buffered saline. Uh, it just depends on the pH range. So that range is around seven, I think. Uh, but for the citrate and for what we were interested in, it was a way to, this. Ha you notice that it happened at lower pH. It, it, it depend, it's a quite interesting uh, process and it doesn't work as well at, 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 higher, at higher pH. Um, I should also, I mean, citrate in, in very, very high quantities uh, can be, uh, bad for cells, but um, we also wash it many, many times to ensure that there are no adverse effects from citrate. Yeah. So yeah, moving on to the next question, Professor Odom, uh, what could be the optimum laser power for maximum DNA release? Do you expect identical behavior with the lasers of different wavelengths? So the, the laser, uh, Okay, so I can't really talk to the power without more talking to the wavelength. So the the most, uh, the zero with order or the first thing that you have to take care of is the wavelength. And uh, and so the wavelength that uh, we were most interested in are these near infrared wavelengths because that's the biologically optically transparent window. We want a ligand release inside cells. Um, but of course you don't have to have it at that wavelength. And then what you would need to uh, think about is what are the localized surface plasma resonances of the different branches? And so our stars have, uh, the heat particles mostly have equal branches. You'll notice that the EEPs have very different wavelengths of branches, I mean, different branch lengths. So for example, if you wanted 
uh, ligand, DNA ligand release from the long tips, you would need one wavelength. Uh, and if you want a DNA release from the shorter tips, then you would need a different wavelength. So the wavelength is the most important to begin with, and then you have to just do the power study. So in line with this power study, uh, we have one more question. Apart from the reshape of gold nanostars, what are the effect of power on the aptomer and complete delivery system? So we have uh, not observed any adverse effects with the powers that we've used on the, to release the ligands on the aptomers themselves. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the mechanism is these, they were using femtosecond pulses. It's cleaving the gold sulfur bond. Okay, and these femtosecond pulses are at long wavelengths, 800 nanometers, 820 nanometers. Uh, any absorption in the features of the aptomers occurs uh, between 200 and 400 nanometers just based on um, uh, the sequence. So I showed you in the uh, circular dichroism uh, measurements, this range between 200 and 400 nanometers gives you an idea, what are the G quadruplex foldings? What are the, um, what are the secondary, tertiary, primary, secondary foldings uh, of the DNA? All of these are very well characteristic features, but they're very far away. So I expect very little, what that means is that you expect very little absorption at these uh, long wavelengths on, on the aptomer. So there's, there's no effect. Thank you, Professor Odom. Uh, so the next question is, have you tried to reduce even more the size of nanoparticles? I mean, gold nanoparticles with different ligands. Have we tried to make the gold nanostars smaller? Yeah, so uh, uh, the, the, the question is around reducing the size of the nanostars that you have shown here by using different kind of ligands. Uh, for the, okay, so we, so I should mention that we uh, use the goods buffers uh, because they're weakly bound to the particle surfaces. So, which means that it's very straightforward to bind to, uh, to get the, the sulfur groups, the disulfide part of the DNA to, to form a gold sulfur bond. This method that we use for DNA, uh, thylated DNA functionalization doesn't work on gold rods because it's hard, very difficult to remove this, uh, this bilayer. It should, there are other methods that I'm aware of based on seed, seed mediated methods where um, you can start with a gold or silver, tiny gold or silver uh, seed particle and then you can grow spikes uh, out, of, out of them. That's one way to reduce the, the size, overall size of the, of the anisotropic particle, but, but I will mention that it's, it's much more difficult to have tiny anisotropic particles than, than tiny spheres, just based on growth directions and energies. Yeah, so uh, the next question is, uh, on binding with gold nanoparticles with gold nanostars, we may witness large near field interactions. Should these strong fields also have any effect on controlled release? Can we engineer them? Yeah, so this is what we're taking advantage of, the, the high localized fields um, at the star tips. Uh, this is because of the high localized fields, we expect release mostly only from that small volume. And we've, we've quantified it um, in our earliest work, meaning if you have, if you apply these femtosecond pulses at not high powers enough to uh, reshape, but just the maximum amount that, that you release, we only get release at the, at the tips which directly takes advantage of these high local optical near fields. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Odin. Uh, so if we increase the concentration of CPG, what happens? Is there a threshold minimum or a maximum beyond which it would actually produce negative or suboptimal effects? Yes. Um, so we haven't tested this with stars, but we did test this with spheres. So there is a, we found that there is a, uh, so we tested the effects of ligand density and then we also CPG ligand density and we also tested the effects of uh, the, the nanoparticle size. And we found that the, the smaller sizes, 
like 13 nanometer spheres versus 50 nanometer spheres, that the smaller sizes are um, better for higher selectivity. Not necessarily the immune response, but higher selectivity because the 50 nanometer spheres would um, have higher overall response, immunostimulatory response, but that's because of off-targeting effects. So it would not only stimulate TLR9, but it would stimulate TLR7 and 8. That's yeah. size. Uh, in terms of ligand uh, density, uh, we found that um, in intermediate, so we tested what we call categorized as low, medium, and high. I forget the, num the quantification numbers now, but we found that in that case, for this application, the medium density was, uh, when it's uniformly functionalized, was preferred over the high level. A hypothesis for that is at least at the high levels, because they're on spheres, they're too tightly packed, so they can't sway enough to, to be able to bind the TLR9 receptor. But the medium to know did work better over the low density. So, yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Odom. As we are reaching the end of the session, uh, I would like to take one question on the journal level. So I would like to know as an author, how do I determine whether my paper is better suited for a journal like ACS Nano Letters versus another one like ACS Material Letters? So what does ACS Nano Letter look out for in a submission? So this is the distinct question. Yeah, so I mean, of course, there is overlap between materials and nano. That's that's for sure. Um, I think for, for nano letters, uh, we're looking for uh, results that focus that whose main outcome is because of nano. So if you're showing them materials of, of properties of say a five micron per big five micron perovskite, um, it may have very interesting optoelectronic properties, and you may be able to tune all of these different uh, facets, increase the stability. It could be perfect, but but mostly that's not a nanoscale effect. That's a materials advance. So that would be more suited for uh, materials versus uh, Nano letters, um, but it, I mean it's hard to answer as a, as a single off. But but this is sort of what we expect. If you're just making a new, if you're just making new types of nanoparticles, either the mechanism needs to be a significant advance because the field has matured over 20 years, or you have a mechanism that produces something that has quite distinct properties, and then it's tied to uh, a different uh, outcome or application. Yeah. So uh, now, as we end the sessions, on behalf of audience, I would like to thank you, Professor Odom, for such an insightful and illustrative talk, and hope you enjoyed the Q&A session.